So the name of the speech is the secret of the redemption, and normally I don't speak about the redemption because it says, Ein ben David ba, le You're not supposed to really talk about the redemption, but that's what they want to talk about, so we're going to give it a more of a pragmatic approach. You know, and I'm sure the speaker that follows me will you know, take it up to the next level. So uh, let's paint a picture for a second. Imagine you're walking, you're walking underneath the bridge in Yerushalayim, the entrance of Yerushalayim, and you're standing there, and suddenly a, this big cloud descends upon you, enveloping you in this cloud. You can't see anything, and suddenly into the cloud walks a tall man in a long, flowing white garment with a long white beard, and he says to you, where am I? You say to him, oh, can't you hear all the sounds of the buses and the cars and the taxis and people walking and the buildings? He says, I don't hear anything right now. You say, and suddenly the cloud disperses, and you see all those buses, the cars, and he says, where am I? You say, you're in Yushalayim. He says, I can't believe it. You say, well, who are you? He says, and he says, my name is Akiva, Akiva ben Yosef. You say, Akiva, where are you, Akiva? Wow, what are you doing here? He says, I'm, I'm back, I'm back, after all this time. But what, where, are, where are we? And I said, Yushalayim, you say to him. Yushalayim, this is Yushalayim, look around you, can't you see? This is Tachem Rekazi over there, that's the bridge, the heart... He said, I can't believe it. The last time I was here, I was looking, I was in Hartzell Film, and I was looking at the, at the Kodesh HaKadoshim, and there was a fax coming out of the Kodesh HaKadoshim. And the, the Chachamim cried, and I laughed, and they said to me, why are you crying? Why are you laughing? And I said, why are you crying? And they said to me, what do you mean? This is the place that the Kohen Gadol couldn't go only on Yom Kippur, and I said, that's exactly why I'm laughing. I'm laughing because if that prophecy came true, so, so, so will this. And here, here I am. And you know, just a couple of hundred years ago, there were four Jews in Yerushalayim. And then a couple hundred. And now, there's a million. <laughs> and there are more Jews in Eretz Yisrael than there are around the world. And that's a miracle. Because Theodore, when Theodore Herzl went to the, I think it was Franz Joseph, he sent him his big plan about bringing the Jews to Eretz Yisrael. And Franz Joseph said to him, my dear Herzl, for that to happen, like seven empires have to fall. And he said, well, look around you. Seven empires fell, and here we are in Yerushalayim. And that might be the biggest miracle in the last couple thousand years. But how did that happen? What's the secret of the redemption? Where did that how did that, where's the step? If you want to look for a, a, a place, an origin for that miracle, the secret of the redemption, where did it begin? I'll ask you another question. Yosef Tzadik, he always had something that bothered him his whole life. He had a problem. He had a tiny on his father. Can anybody tell me what you think Yosef Tzadik's tiny on his father is? He had a complaint against his father. Anybody care to ask to explain to me what Yosef Tzadik's taina was. He had a complaint against his father, and only at the end of his life does his father tell him the answer to his complaint. He explains why. Anybody want to? I know it's not like such an you know, interactive class over here, but feel free to speak up, and I'll repeat what you say so that the camera catches it. And that's another thing I want to bring up over here. What Yosef Tzadik had something against. He had a taina. He had a chip on his shoulder for many years, he, something he didn't understand about his father's behavior. And only at the end of his life did the father explain to him the answer to what was bothering Yosef Metzalim for so many years. And finally, there's another two points. Point number one, we want to, I want to delve into the relationship between Rachel and Leah, and we try to understand something that bothered me for many, many years, and eventually we'll get from there to Yaakov Avinu and Rachel and Leah. Okay. So, in our parashas now, this is very fascinating, probably some of the most fascinating parashas in the whole Torah right now, and Leah and Rachel is one of the, I think, I had a big question for many, many years. The question was, Ruvain goes, he finds Dudan, he finds these flowers in the field, he brings them home to his mother, and he says, here, mommy, I brought you a present, and his mother's very excited because these flowers have the power to make the husband want to be with the wife. And they also have another power, these flowers have another power, they also can help a woman have children. So Rachel sees the flowers, and she says to her sister, can I please have your flowers? And her sister says to her an answer that for me, it bothered me many, many for many years, it bothered me, and I didn't understand, and I asked many people, and I never got clarity in this. And that basically, the, she says to her, this is what Leah says to Rachel, is it not bad enough that you took my husband, you also want to take my son's flowers? Now, I didn't understand this answer. This answer, just, it does, it's incomprehensible. Excuse me, whose husband is this? Whose husband is this? 
This is not your husband. I'm sorry. This is not your husband. Let's, let's back up a little bit over here. When did Yaakov meets Rachel in, in one of the biggest, this probably the most special marriage in Torah, together with maybe with Rachel and Rabbi Akiva, right? two Rachels, both special marriages. And what happens? From the moment he meets her, he's willing to work seven years for this girl. Most people aren't willing to work three days for somebody. He's willing to work seven years for somebody. Now you want to tell me that Leah didn't know who he was, walking, who he was working for? He, she thought he was working for her? Everybody knew it. Everybody knew who he was working for. It wasn't a secret. Oh, now let's take this question to the next level. Leah's eyes were red. Right? Why were her eyes red? Because she was happy that she was going to marry Yaakov Avinu? No. Her eyes were red because she was crying because everybody said, Rachel's marrying Yaakov and Leah's marrying Asa. Whose husband is this? Your, your sister exhibited, this, I mean, the, the type of level of Messiah Snefesh that nobody in the whole history of the world exhibits gives you the simonim. And your response is, it's not bad enough. You took my husband, you want to take my flowers off. What kind of an answer is this? Where's your Akar Satayv? Akar Satayv is the hallmark of the Jewish people. Where's your Akar Satayv? So some people say, it's not, a good, it's not a good question. Leah didn't know. She thought that that's what Yaakov wanted. And Rachel came and told her the Simonim. And that's what she thought was really Yaakov's Kavana. Except it doesn't really work. If you, if you think about it, it doesn't work. Because the Medrash tells us what happened. Okay? Yaakov and Leah going to the tent. Wedding night, it's dark, nobody sees anything. Rachel tells Leah the Simonim. Yaakov thinks he's with Leah. The next morning, sunlight shines over Charon. The rooster crows. Dim light enters the tent. Yaakov sits up and he looks over to his left. And lo and behold, it is not Rachel, it is Leah. Yaakov is like, good morning, darling. He doesn't say that. He's like, what are you doing here? Now, if, if Leah thinks that Yaakov wants to be married, so then she should be like, oh, let me get you breakfast in bed. It should be like, oh, good morning. It's the day after the marriage, right? No, it's like, what are you doing here? And what's her response? Her response is, oh, what do you mean what am I doing here? What you did to your father and your brother, I'm doing to you. It's like, that's marriage 101 over here, you know? It's like the first second. They just got married, and they're like this major machlaikis over here. So I don't really see how anyone could have a have. I mean, I don't really see how anybody could think, oh, they're supposed to be married. I mean, from where are you getting this from? So I, I really, for years, I'm struggling with this concept. Where is Leah coming from when she says, it's not enough you took my husband, you want to take my son's flowers. Your husband's not your husband. It's my husband. I was my son, I gave you. I gave you Yaakov Avinu. I gave you Shvatim. I gave you Shiftei Ka. I gave you things that nobody could have. And you're telling me you can't give me the flowers. Where is your custom? Where is your Rahmanis? What's going on over here? Okay. So I heard, I asked, and I spoke, and I discussed this with many people, many rabbeim, and I never got a satisfactory answer. Until somebody tells me the following. I, had, I was talking about this. Met one day with somebody. He says, you know, and, we, and he says to me, wait a second. What about if Leah is pulling a Chana and Penina situation over here. You know, right? What's Chana and Penina? Penina, what does Penina do? Penina makes Chana David. I said, it can't be. It's a, how do I know it can't be? It's not a Penina and Chana situation. Because what happened to Penina after she did what she did? Her children all died. Therefore, if you try to do this to somebody, it's very dangerous. Not recommended. It's playing with fire. If you try to hurt someone, so they should daven, it could very well rebound on you. It's not recommended. I don't think it could be that Leah's doing this because nothing happened to her. We don't find that any, she was punished. We don't find anything. So what is it? Unless, unless really that's what it was. She wanted her to dive in. Except there's one way that it actually could be a Chana and Penina situation and, and nothing's going to happen to the person doing it. And that is if Leah proves that she cares about her sister. By doing an action so astounding that it, it, there's no doubt at all that she, all she wants is her sister's care. What did Leah do that proved with beyond a shadow of a doubt that everything she did for, was really with her sister's best interest in mind? Does anybody know? Do you know? What did she do? It's, 
Nobody else ever did this in the history of the Jewish people. One, there's a one time, one, one example. Anybody? Nobody else ever did this before. Come on. What did Leah do? That was clearly tremendous mysterious nefesh. No one ever did it. What did she do? She gave her the flowers. That's not what I'm talking about. What did Leah do? All right, so I'm going to tell you. Thank you. Thank you very much. She gave her her son. She was expecting another one of the Shvatim, and she dived into Hashem, switch it, and give me a girl instead to give up one of the shifted car. We can't even comprehend what that means. When she did that, that is tremendous. That's up there with the Nefesh of giving some of your husband. That's the, same, that's the same level. Then we can say, okay, now I know. You wanted a David. Now I got it. I understand now what you did. You, you, you put it to that. You wanted a David, and, but you're also willing to put your money where your mouth is and do Messias Nefesh and give her something that's worth. There's no, there's no price for that. Okay. I finally understand. Good. Thank you. So that's, that's Pshat with Leah and Rachel. Okay. Which brings me to something else, okay? And this is, instead of between Leah and Rachel, it's between Yaakov and Leah. Yaakov and Rachel, okay. And the Torah tells us a painful and perplexing dialogue between the two of them. Rachel sees she has no children. Her sister has a whole bunch of children. She has none. She comes to Yaakov Avinu and she says to him, give me children. If not, I am dead. If, if, if not, I'm dead. I, I just can't live anymore. I don't want to live. Give me children. And Yaakov gets upset at Rachel. Yaakov's anger flares at Rachel. And he says to her, this is a, and this is a, a very cold, very cold, like logical, like man-like response. He says, Hasachas elekim anoichi, am I God who has not given you children? Okay, now let's think about this for a second. Let's analyze this. Why is Rachel asking for such an illogical request? Can't she ask for such? Well, let's think about it. Why is she doing this? Is she doing this because she's happy? No, she's not happy. What's going on? She's in emotional turmoil. She is a wreck. She is jealous of her sister. Her sister has kids. She has no children. She can't believe she got to this point where her sister has all the shit they caught, and she does it. She gave up her husband. She has no kids. She's coming from a place, maybe it's irrational, What's the proper response to a woman in such distress? Is it, am I God? What are you doing? It's outrageous, but, but it's coming from a place of somebody who's feeling complete. She's, she's feeling at the end, of, like she has no hope. On the other hand, we can understand why Rachel talks this way. On the other hand, it's much harder to understand how Yaakov Avinu talks this way. What does he say to her? Am I God, he says to her? Now, how does he permit his anger at his wife to make him say such a thing? The Medrash tells us that the Rabbi Nishalaylam takes Yaakov to task for what he did. He gives him a mustashmus, and he tells Yaakov Avinu, is this the way to talk to a woman in distress? Kach oinen This is the way you talk to somebody who's suffering? How could you talk to her like that, Yaakov? So this conversation leaves us with a lot of that, with a lot of questions. Like, how did Yaakov talk to her? Maybe he made a mistake. Let's say Yaakov Avinu made a mistake and he got upset. Maybe because you know a man, a man's classic response, they want to fix the situation, right? The woman comes and says, I got a problem. The man says, okay, let me fix it. Where's my hammer? She doesn't want, she doesn't, she's not looking for a solution. And there is no solution over here, right? There is no real solution. But he wants to fix it. So he can't fix it. He gets upset, right? Maybe. Okay, I don't want to psychoanalyze it in the obvious, but, you know, whatever it is. Now, if that's the case, the Yaakov Avinu wants to help. He can't help. He gets upset. The Rabbani Shalom gives him Musr. If Hashem gives him Musr, shouldn't he be telling Yaakov, you know, this is not what you should do, but you know what you should do? This. This is what you should do. When you tell someone Musr, and you don't like what they're doing, so you tell them, you know, that wasn't right, but this is what you're supposed to do. Does Hashem tell Yaakov what yes to do? He's, I see he tells him what not to do. Where does he tell him what yes to do? If he's going to tell him what not to do, tell him... I don't see it. Where does he tell him? What about my see of a similar abundance, right? The abundance Shalom is there to tell us. We're supposed to learn from everything that happens to us in the Torah. What are we supposed to learn from this story? What are we learning from this? So now, if we take this situation, this conversation, 
this painful interchange between Yaakov and Rachel. And the Rabbani Shalom gives Yaakov a Musashmuz. And he says to him, how can you talk to someone who's suffering like this? The scene flashes forward a thousand years. What's happening a thousand years later? The Medrash tells us, the Rabbani Shalom is talking about the destruction of the Jewish people. Destruction of the first base of Megiddo is about to happen. And now there's going to be a courtroom drama in Shemayim. And the Jewish people are going to have defense attorneys come and try to, to save them. Avram Avinu is going to come and he's going to say to the Rabbeinu Shalaylam, he's going to walk in front of us, Rabbeinu Shalaylam, did I not, was I not willing to stand and to shecht my own son? And Hashem says to him, I'm sorry, it's not good enough. Yitzchak comes and he says, Rabbeinu Shalaylam, who laid down on a mezbeach and when my father wanted to shecht me, I said, tie me up tighter so I shouldn't move and then the carbon will have a blemish. I did it for you. Hashem says, I'm sorry doesn't work. Yaakov Avinu comes. Maishu Rabbeinu comes. Everybody's trying. No. Nobody. Nothing works. It's only when Rachel Imenu shows up and says to Rabbeinu Shalom, I took my own sister into my house. That the Rabbeinu Shalom says, okay. And let's quote what, what happens over here. Okay. Rachel jumps before the Rabbi Shalaylam and she rem reminds the Kodesh Baruch Hu that she surrendered her husband so that her, so that her sister shouldn't be embarrassed. Yirmiyo, he, he paints the powerful portrait of this moment. What does he say? Kol Baramad Hashma, a voice is heard on high. Wailing, bitter weeping. Rachel Mavaka al Rachel is crying for her children. She refuses to be consoled for her children for they are gone. Let me ask you, in effect, what is Rachel really saying over here at this moment? How come it's only Rachel's defense that works? Everybody's done great things. These are the pillars of the Jewish people. Avram Avinu, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe Rabbeinu. Come on, you can't get better than that. No, it's only when Rachel comes. Why? What is so special about what Rachel says that makes sure that she's the one who saves the Jewish people? And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. What happened before? Rachel comes to Yaakov. Rachel says to Yaakov, give me children. If not, I am dead. Yaakov says to Rachel, am I God? Hashem says to Yaakov, how do you talk to a woman in distress like this? Well, what's happening right now? Rachel comes to Hashem. She says to Hashem, give me my children. If not, I am dead. Isn't that what you just said to Hashem in the courtroom? If you don't give me my children, I will not be consoled. I am a woman in distress. Isn't that what happened? Now, what's the Shem's response? Am I God? <laughs> I think yes. I think you are. Are you going to say to me, am I God who can't? Yes, you can. If anyone can do it, it's you. It's a catch-22 situation. Is Yaakov you know, waiting on the side? He's waiting to see what Hashem's going to do. Hashem gave him a message. He doesn't mean, is that the way you talk to someone, a woman in distress? If Hashem says to Rachel, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you back your kids. Rachel's going to be like, is this the way you talk to a woman in distress? What's Hashem going to do? Okay. So Yaakov is waiting to hear Kodesh Baruch's words. What does Hashem say? What does Hashem say? The only thing Hashem can say. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For there is reward for your accomplishment, the word of Hashem. And they will return from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, the word of Hashem. And your children will return to their border, Yermiyo. The fact that millions of Yidin have returned to Eretz Yisrael which is clearly the first steps, or the middle steps of the Geula, is a direct conclusion of the promise that the Rabbani Shalom made to Rachel Imenu thousands of years ago. That's posh. You don't have to be a Tziyayin, a Zionist, and not a Zionist. It has nothing to do with that. But how can anybody look around Eretz Israel and not say this is the greatest miracle? You understand? This is posh that it's the greatest miracle. The fact that there are more Jews in Eretz Israel today then around the world, the fact that when the Ramban came here, there were barely any Jews, right? If you look at Jewish history, there were, not, there were four Jews in Yerushalayim a couple hundred years ago. 
That was it. And today, Tachlan Merkazi. Buses, car, taxi, boom, boom, donkeys. Okay, no donkeys. But if you think about it, unbelievable. What's going on over here? It's a direct consequence of the promise that the Bani Shalom gave to Rachel Imei. I'm going to tell you a story about Kol Ramah just because it doesn't really have anything to do with the conclusion. It's just a nice story about Kol Ramah with a nice message. So, I wrote a book with a fine Yid by the name of David Nadav. Rav David Nadav, we sat together. He's done Kiruv in Eretz Yisrael, a lot of interesting programs. Him and his family, his wife, they moved to, they moved to a place like Savion, with Eretz Aliyah, the places where no Kiruv organizations have survived. And they would proceed to do Kiruv and to change neighborhoods of very, very upper class neighborhoods. He told me the following story. I ended up writing the whole book, and at the end they decided they didn't want to publish it at that time. It was an interesting, great book. Well, one day we'll see what happens to that book. I still want that book to come out. I'll go upon him, I'll tell you a story from this book. He told me the following. He said, Rav David Nadav, as a child, was a star soloist, London School of Jewish Song. He's the kid who sang that song, Kol Baraman Shema. he's the kid who sang. And he came from a family where the mother, his mother got sick when he was 14 years old. She had to go to America. And his father went with his mother. By the time she came back, she was a different person. She went again, she came back, and now there was nobody to talk to. The operations, she comes back to Eretz Yisrael, that you cannot talk to her. She was, kids said, you couldn't talk to her. There was nobody to talk to her. Now, if you'd see her in the street, his brother built a wheelchair for his mother, a very special wheelchair with all sorts of gadgets. And like, again, just going back 35 years, when there weren't, it was a really special wheelchair. It's on display in Tel Shomer Hospital today. That's what he told me at least a couple of years ago. With a sign that says, this is what you can do if you really care. His mother, every time she went on the street, the sisters would make sure she would make up, she looked amazing. But if you come close, then you see there's, there's nobody to talk to. But they took very good care of her. Now, David came from a family, it's on, the, on his father's side, he's an El Nadav, Nadav, El Nadav. His grandfather was a Petan. He was a Chazan in the court of the kings of Yemen. On his mother's side, he was, she was a Sperber from London. He was, she was the niece of the Vizhnitzer Rebetzin. So it was a very interesting mix of European Hasidish royalty versus Yemenite royalty, a very interesting mix. And he barely knew English, but he wanted a girl like his, mo- like his mother. Eventually, that's what he would want, somebody who spoke English, and it wasn't going for him. I'll go find him, that's in the future. Now, he says to me the following. He says, the only time we were able to communicate with our mother, and it was a little bit like it used to be, was on Moitzi Shabbos. Then, we would all be around the table, and we would sing the song she loved so much, and then a light would come to her eyes, and we were able to communicate with her, you know, not as much as it was, but some degree. He says, okay. So fast forward a couple of years. He says, I'm in learning in Kol Torah by Shlomo Zalman Orbach, Talmud, very close to Shlomo Zalman. He says, and one day I hear Yigal Salak is bringing the London School of Jewish Song to Yerushalayim for one concert at Binyanei Ha'umba. And suddenly an idea comes to me, he says. And I think to myself, I'm going to call up Yigal. I'm going to tell him. Can I please sing at this concert? I want to sing Kol Brahma on the stage. I want to bring my mother to the concert. I want her to sit in the front row. And I know how good it's going to be for her neshama and how much it's going to help her. So he calls up Yigal Salik. Yigal says, says, who's this? Do do not that. Do do my neshama, how are you doing? Baruch Hashem. What can I do for you? He says, I would like to ask you for a favor. I would like to come to B'nai Naoma and sing a song for my mother. Which song? Kol Brahma the song that Rachel Imenu sang in Shemayim that saved the Jewish people. I want to save my mother with this song. Do the Yigal Salak says, for you, do do anything. No problem. He says, it wasn't like today where there are ramps for wheelchairs, it's accessible, handicap, much harder. Much harder to get there, but they take the wheelchair into B'ni Neoma and they carry it up the stairs and they bring it down the aisle till it's in the front row. He says, Yigal Salak's a master of the dramatic. The lights go off. The whole hall is dark. 
except for the front, the lights in the front of the stage. And Yigal says, do you remember a song, Kol Barama? Oh, boy, like, ah. Do you remember a little boy sang it, Dudu Nadar? Ah. He says, well, here he is tonight. A small voice is heard on high, wailing, bitter weeping. Rachel Imeno is standing before Hashem. He gives a whole introduction to the song. And Dovin and Dad tells me, I get on the stage with my guitar, and I'm standing there, I'm going to sing the song for my mother who's sitting in the front row. And I open my mouth to sing, the orchestra's about to start, the choir's going to back me. I open my mouth, and suddenly I sing a different song. I don't understand. As if somebody took control of my vocal cords, as if right now I want to tell you a story and out comes a song. There a song was supposed to come out and a different song came out in its place. He doesn't understand. Instead of singing Kol Baraman the, the cry, the plea of Rachli Menu to Rabbi Nishalem that saved the day in Shemayim because you put Hashem in the corner. The catch 22. Am I God? Are you God? Yes, you are. You have to save the Jews. What comes out? Pada b'shalom nafshi ani elelokim akrav Hashem yoshieni. That's the words of the song. I call out to Hashem, and Hashem answers me. It's a different song. Great words, great lyrics, but a different song. The choir is taken aback. The orchestra doesn't know what to do. The people are sitting there. They don't know what's happening. Nobody understands. Least of all, David Nadav. He sings the song and he opens his mouth. It's beautiful. He sings it beautifully. He has a great voice. He doesn't understand what happened though. Concert's over. He goes back to yeshiva, called Torah. Gets into the dorm. There's a message from him. Your Rebbe calls. He goes to answer the phone. Goes to call up his Rebbe. His Rebbe says to him, David, Shtagata. Shtagata? You went crazy? You out of your mind? He says, what do you mean? He says, what do you think? You're Mordechai Medevin? You're Shlomo Kabach? You're Joe Omar? I mean, you're a Chosh Rebbe and called Torah. Where do you come to getting on a stage at a concert and singing? Like, Hello? You want me to help you with Shaduchim? I'm the one I'm supposed to help you find the girl, the perfect blend, the perfect mix, the American, the English, the Israeli, everything together. You want me to do that? How can I do that? If you get on the stage and you sing as if you're some singer. I can't help you. I'm sorry. You're on your own from now on. Goodbye. And, was, and from there, my final hope, he says, is dashed. I was relying on this Rebbe, and it's gone. I go into my dorm room. I lay down on my bed, and I cry the whole night. In the morning, I walk into the base measure. Shlomo Zama looks at me. He sees that I'm crying. He says, my eyes are red. And he says to me, David, what's wrong? And I said to him, tell him the whole story. He says to me, let me ask you a question. Why did you do this? For yourself or for your mother? For my mother. So what are you worried about? He says, and there I understood the difference between a Talmud Chacham and a Gado. Right then. What was the outcome of the story? The outcome of the story was there was a girl sitting in the balcony. <laughs> a blonde girl from America <laughs> who spoke a beautiful English. Her name was Gold, Libby Gold. And they'd been trying to get her to go out with this Yemenite boy, and she hadn't been interested. But then they said to her, listen, he's going to sing at this concert. Go hear him sing. So she went, and she heard him sing to his mother a song. And she said, you know what, I'm going to go out with him. And then together, they raised a beautiful family, went around the country doing Kirov, and they've done amazing things. It's all in a book that maybe one day will be published. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, now I understood. I understood why I said those words. I'm standing on the stage. I don't know where my Yeshua is going to come from. From whence will come the salvation? And I opened my mouth and I said, Ani el elakim ekra, I call out to God, Vashem Yeshieni, and Hashem answers me. And there she is, up in the balcony. Okay. And that story, I always say it in this class because it's just so Kobra Manishma, Rachel Imenu. It had repercussions till today, from then till today, just in so many different arenas and so many stages. Literally, in this story, it was on a stage, but in just so many different places. So now, we have two questions left. Did Yaakov Avinu know what was going to happen when Rachel came to stand before Hashem in the courtroom? Let's see. Yaakov Avinu, I don't think, was surprised by what happened in Shemaim. Why not? 
And we're going to go into a Rashi, and that Rashi that we only find out years later, right before Yaakov Avinu passes away, Rashi tells us about the events that happened on his deathbed, which also will answer the question of what Yosef at Tzadik was upset, he was angry at his father for many years. Yaakov Avinu was about to die. And he decides, for now, I have time for me to tell my son, I know he's been upset at me for years. I know why. You know why he's upset at me? He's angry at me because he feels I let down his mother. Right? Who's buried in Mars Machtelo? Not Rachel. Where's Rachel buried? On the side of the road. And Yosef Tzadik's like, why did you bury my mother? You loved my mother. She was the one you wanted to marry from the second you saw her. How could you bury her on the side of the road? And he, for years, Yosef Tzadik is thinking about this, and it bothers him. Why? Abba, why did you do this? And Yaakov Avinu knows it. He knows it bothers. So now he's about to pass away. It's his final illness. He calls Yosef at Tzadik. He says the following, Do kindness and truth with me. Please do not bury me in Mitzrayim. And when I die, take me out of Egypt and bury me in Ma'aras Machpel. And again, he calls Yosef at Tzadik when he's about to pass away. And he says, I want to tell you, I know this has been bothering me for many years, I want to tell you the answer to what's been on your mind. It's been weighing you down. I'm going to explain my behavior. And he says the following. And when I came from Padan, Rachel died on me in the land of Canaan. And if you're thinking to yourself, okay, you know, it was probably, you're probably trying to come up with answers why I did what I did. There was still a measure of land to go to Ephrat. I buried there, there on the road to Ephrat, which is based Lechem, says his father to Yosef at Tzadik. And then Yosef says to his son, you probably said to yourself, I know why Abba did that. I have to come up with an explanation. I know why he did it. It was probably raining. It's probably the raining season. He says, let me tell you. It says, Rashi, although I trouble you to take me to be buried in the land of Canaan, though I did not do so for your mother, and do not say that rains prevented me from burying her in Hebron, it was the dry season. I'm sorry, my son, it wasn't the reason. And I buried her there. I did not take her with me to Beis Lechem. And I know that you harbored hard feelings in your heart against me for what I did. I know. And here comes the great revelation. But you should know that I did this because Hashem told me to. I buried Rachel there so that she should be of aid to her children, he says, when the Vuzeradim will put them in exile. Rachel will go out. This is all from Yirmiyo. Rachel will go out. And she will weep and seek mercy for her children. Thus says Hashem, Kol Shema, a voice is heard on high, wailing, bitter weeping. Rachel is crying for her children. She refuses to be consoled. Rachel's in fact saying, give me my children. If not, I am dead. The Kodesh Baruch Hu has no choice but to say, okay, Rachel, I'm sparing your children. She, he can't say anything. He has nothing else to say. Thus says Hashem, restrain your voice from weeping. Wipe the tears from your eyes. It's, okay. it's, it's going to be okay. Don't worry, Rachel. Rachel manages to elicit from the Rabbani Shalom a commitment that nobody else does. Yaakov Avinu knew it was going to happen because Hashem told him, bury her there because this is what's going to happen. And you will see the way to talk to a woman in distress. You will see it because I will answer her. And you will know how to answer a woman in distress. Yosef Tzavik now knows why his father didn't bury his mother in Mars Machpel. He's not, he doesn't feel bad anymore. He knows why. There's one question. Why did Yaakov Avinu wait until he was dying to tell Yosef? All those years, Yosef Atzalik was worried and upset, and he, he felt the heaviness weighing him down. How come he waited so long? And the answer is, just like when Yaakov Avinu wanted to tell the Jewish people what's going to happen at the end of time, he forgot. He lost his Ruach HaKadosh. You don't talk about the terrible times of the future until you have no choice, and you have to. It's at the end of his life, that's when Yaakov Avinu told his son about what was going to happen, not before. Which takes me back to the beginning. Rabbi Akiva standing there in a cloud, the entrance to Yerushalayim. You're standing next to him, and he says to you, where am I? And the cloud shifts, and there it is, beautiful Yerushalayim. Millions of people rushing by, buses, cars, taxis. Wow! It's amazing. I don't understand. Last time I was here, I was standing on Hartzofim and I saw a fox coming out of the Kodesh HaKadoshim. And you say, Rabbi Akiva, your prophecy came true. That's where it all began. It all began. 
when HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Rachel Imenu, I give you a commitment that one day your children will return. And we are the fulfillment of that commitment. This is the secret of the redemption. Thank you very much. Thank you.